for those who say that I am currently entangled in a haram relationship. I am a victim of some sort of obsession with the opposite gender. I am an addict even to perhaps images or someone may say pornography. My heart is drunk on lust. What do I do to free myself to rediscover Allah and the world and the afterlife? I suggest for you and for me, dear brother, dear sister, a medicine that is made up of seven components. The first component is the lowering of the gaze. Ibn al-Qayyim, he says, every calamity begins with the glands and most wildfires begin with a spark. One who complains of being chastised by lust and desire but insists on not changing their habits when it comes to gaze is like a person who is complaining of a draft and he's refusing to close the door. It's not going to change. It begins here, closing this huge gate to your heart called the eyes. And you will say to me, it's tough. I'll say to you, I know. But Imam Ibn Al-Qayyim, he says, the patience needed to lower the gaze is less than the patience needed for the consequences that follow if you don't lower your gaze. Component number two of this medicine, marriage. The Prophet wasallam said, there is nothing like marriage for two who love one another. How is it that the very same fire that destroys nations and burns up livelihoods and kills people is the same fire that happens to heat up our buildings and cooks our food? How come? Well, because the first fire that destroys people was an untamed fire, unrestricted fire, uncontrolled unchanneled, unguided, and so it killed and destroyed. Whereas the second fire that we benefit from, it comes to us through channels, pipes, cylinders. It's guided, it's limited. And so we grow and we eat, and we are warm and we are happy. The same can be said about relationships and sex. If it breaks free from the confines of Sharia, and it is outside of the parameters of a halal Islamic marriage, it burns, it injures, it causes regret and it causes a scorching heat in this world and in the hereafter. Whereas when it is channeled through an Islamic marriage, it causes growth, it causes happiness, it brings about a joy, I swear by Allah, that is perhaps only second place to the joy of knowing Allah. If however you discover that marriage is not feasible for one reason or another, for example, you need to run away with this girl and take her away from her father and against the will of her family for this marriage to happen, etc., then you walk away from the relationship if marriage is not feasible. Don't give farewells. Don't give her an Islamic sermon how this is for the sake of Allah. Don't do any of that. Change your number, delete the number, block the number, change the phone if you need to, change your scenario, lock the door, throw away the key. And with time you will recover, I promise. With time you will rediscover yourself and rediscover Allah and rediscover the home of the hereafter and rediscover the bigger picture of life. Because distance is dryness, as Ibn Taymiyyah said. And whenever you stop remembering something frequently, its effects on the heart will be released. Number three, remember the deficiencies of the beloved. One poet, he says, if one was to recall the defects of the beloved, this person would no longer be besotted. Recall the defect. Like, get a grip. What is it, an angel? It's a human being. It's a man. It's a woman. Insan. Deficient. Relax. Why are you losing sleep? Why are you losing weight? Just in case you forgot, this person belches, burps, defecates, I'm sorry to say, urinates, vomits, menstruates. This person has bodily hair in all sorts of interesting places. This person has a horrible body odor if it's not controlled through baths and showering and perfumes. This person has all sorts of disgusting habits that have been carefully curated and edited and photoshopped and obscured during the courting phase through the masks of obsession. No, there's more to it. Relax. Remember the deficiencies of the beloved. And that's why Ibn Taymiyyah, he said, passion, he said, obsession by definition is the corruption of knowledge and perception and imagination. It's not true. Number four, remember the perfection of what awaits in Jannah. That will help us overcome it. And that is why the Prophet Sallallahu describes both the men and women in Jannah. The Prophet Sallallahu describes first of all the men of Jannah. He said, men in Jannah are given the strength of 100 men with respect to eating, drinking, desire, and marital relations. They are Jurda, free of all bodily hair. Murda, no more beards. His eyes are anointed with kuhul, filled with vitality and strength and vibrancy and energy and excitement. These are the men of Jannah created in the form of our father Adam alayhi salatu wassalam. La ilaha illallah. 
As for the women of Jannah, the Prophet ﷺ said, If a woman from paradise was to overlook into the people of this world, the beauty of her face would illuminate everything between the heavens and the earth, and she would fill it with her beautiful scent. That's a glance. And then he said the garment that she wears on her head for beauty is better than the world and everything within it. If that is the garment on her head, then what about the beauty and the splendor and perfection of the individual beneath it? Number five of this medicine, realize that Allah Jalla Jalaluhu will not leave you empty handed when you make the decision to walk away. If you think that you're going to break this relationship and walk away and Allah will leave you scot-free with nothing to look out for and nothing to be excited for, you have thought bad thoughts about Allah Jalla Jalaluhu. No, the replacement the alternative is already on its way. And that is why Abu Qatada and Abu Dahma, they said, we went to an Arab Bedouin man and we said to him, have you ever heard the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say anything? And he said, yes, I heard him say, whenever you leave something for the sake of Allah, Allah will replace it with something that is better. That is a promise of Allah, you better believe it. Number six, fill your life with life and afterlife defining activity. Don't keep your heart empty because that will then become prone to every satanic whispering, every devilish thought and every doubt in the religion. Many times the reason why we fall captive to these images and these conversations and these messages that come our way is not because we're weak. It's because our hearts are empty. There is nothing there. So anything can settle. The poet, he said, her love came to me before I knew what love was, but it met an empty heart and so it resided, an empty heart. Brothers, they ask, how is it that we have so few narrations that deal with hormonal youth, how to address our children who are now teenagers and they're looking to the opposite gender. How come the hadith does not speak much about this age range? I say to you because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not deal with it verbally. He dealt with it practically by giving those young men and young women projects to think about. So they were not going to be slowed down by no petty appetite in haram. Abdullah ibn Abbas, young man, you are responsible for tafsir. Abu Huraira, young man, you're responsible for hadith. Khalid ibn Walid, you pick up the sword, jihad is your position. Usama ibn Zayd, 17, 18 year old, no problem, you lead an army against the Roman Empire. Ja'far, you make your way to Abyssinia, give da'wah. Mus'ab, you go to Yathrib, Medina, give da'wah. Ibn Jabal, you go to Yemen, give da'wah. Allahu Akbar. He activated within them a sense of purpose, a goal, a vision. What is your vision in life? And that became such a powerful light that it obscured every other appetite and haram. They refused to be slowed down by the impermissible. Number seven, and I conclude with this, call upon Allah for help and cry your eyes out to Allah and ask him, if you don't turn away from me these desires, Ya Allah, I will be weak. Make dua. And that is why Yusuf alayhi salam, what did he do? When they conspired against him, the women, he raised his hands and he said, wa illa tasrif anni kaydahun asbu ilayhinna wa akum min al My Lord, if you don't turn away from me their plotting, I will become weak and then I will be from the ignorant ones. What was the outcome? فَاسْتَجَابَ لَهُ رَبُّهُ So his Lord responded to him, فَصَرَفَ عَنْهُ كَيْدَهُنْ And he averted from him their plotting, إِنَّهُ هُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ He is the hearing and he is the knowing. In conclusion, your brothers and sisters, man by his nature, he has a tendency to look for happiness where it is easiest to search for it, not where it is actually found. And I say this because when all is said and done, the ultimate remedy for lust and haram impulses is to love Allah Jalla Jalaluhu. Find a way to love Him. Because becoming attached to people is pain and injury and a scorching heat and regret. And becoming attached to Allah is relief and a cure from pain and tranquility and inner expanse. And when you discover that Allah whom you then love, you will discover a Lord who is not obsessed with your habits, but a Lord who wants from you your heart. And once you give Him your heart, He will then take care of your habits.